according to CNN Money, between all of the states in the U.S. and all of our federal agencies uh, and many other organizations, there is collectively being held in trust more than $58 billion in unclaimed cash and benefits. That's almost $200 for every resident of the United States. And all of that uh, unclaimed uh, property comes from a variety of sources, including abandoned bank accounts and stock holdings, uh, unclaimed life insurance payments, and forgotten pension payments, among other things. Uh, in 2012, one resident of the state of Connecticut was able to claim $33 million, which were proceeds from the sale of nearly 1.3 million shares of stock on which they had been listed as a beneficiary. Now, can you imagine how crazy it would be to uh, wake up to uh, a nice little gift like that? That would be, that'd be amazing. Here's something even crazier to think about. Uh, imagine that you were the recipient of just such uh, an inheritance, and you step forward to claim what is yours, and it is given to you. Uh, but then somebody uh, in your life convinces you that it would really be better for you if you just gave all of that money back and then continued working as hard as you could the rest of your life uh, in order to earn what you had just been given as a gift. How many people th think that sounds like a good idea? Okay? Nobody. That's good. I'm glad. Because it's not. That's not a good idea. Uh, that would be a nightmare, literally. I mean, that's, uh, if I had that dream one night that I was given that sum of money and then for some reason gave it back, that'd be the kind of thing that would send me, you know, shooting up in bed and maybe even yelling, no, you know, that'd be awful. Uh, in today's chapter, uh, in the book of Galatians, uh, Paul's writing to uh, these believers here, uh, and he is experiencing just that sort of nightmare, uh, only this time it's for real. So if you brought a Bible with you, if you want to go ahead and open up to Galatians chapter 4, um, don't worry if you didn't bring a Bible with you, the scriptures will be uh, on the screen up here behind me. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, the fourth chapter in this book that we've been looking at for a few weeks now, and... Uh, if uh, you want to go ahead and take out the uh, message notes insert from your bulletin as well, there's some little fill-in-the-blanks there and some of the scriptures we're going to look at. And also, if you haven't yet, uh, take a moment to fill out the little white envelope uh, to throw in the offering baskets at the end of the service. Uh, we're calling this uh, study through the book of Galatians uh, this summer, Freedom from Religion, because that's what this whole book is about. This letter that Paul is writing to the churches in the region of Galatia that, that he helped to get started um, is about this conflict between the good news of Jesus that he uh, taught them and trained them in, and this false gospel that has been introduced after the fact uh, to the Galatian people that is telling them that the Christian faith, uh, that the Christian life is about grace plus law, plus following rules. And in chapter 1 of Galatians, just as, as a way of a quick review, uh, Paul makes the case that the gospel that he preached to these churches was a message that he had received directly from Jesus. And so uh, he knew it, it was the truth. Uh, and then in chapter 2, Paul talks about how many years into his ministry, he went and met with the rest of the apostles that had followed Jesus and confirmed that they were preaching the same message. So what Paul has to share here is, is truly and directly from Jesus. And so the first two chapters are sort of biographical. He's, he's laying the background of, of remember my story, remember how I got this message, and remember um, what it was that I shared with you. Uh, and then chapters 3 and 4, um, we looked at look, that last week and this week, are very theological. That means they're, they're very uh, deep chapters. They're full of um, some powerful truths about God and his relationship with his people over time. And so Paul reaches way back into Jewish history um, to point to some foundational truths that he wants these Galatian Christians to hold on to uh, and not lose or, or give up voluntarily uh, even. And so last week, specifically in chapter 3, uh, Paul introduces this argument that the man God called uh, Abraham from the Old Testament, that those who have placed their faith in Jesus are the true children of Abraham. Um, and they are heirs of the promise that God made to Abraham hundreds of years before he gave the law through Moses. Uh, and that promise that God gave to Abraham and is continued on into to the lives of Christians today is for right standing before God and for living under his blessing and also being an instrument of his blessing to the rest of the world. And Paul referenced uh, Genesis 15, 6 last week, which says, Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. 
Not because he followed rules, not because he obeyed laws, not because he jumped through hoops, because of his faith. And in Genesis 18, 18, God says, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. So the Lord counted Abraham. He considered him. He appointed him. He designated him as right with God, as right with himself. That's what righteous means, because of Abraham's faith. Well, Abraham's faith in who? Well, not in himself, of course, his faith in God. And this is an important distinction to make here. The scripture says that Abraham believed God, not that Abraham believed in God. Those are two different things. Believing in God is just uh, giving mental assent to the fact that there is a God, that he does exist, and there's nothing particularly admirable about that uh, sort of faith. James, the brother of Jesus, writes, uh, you believe there is one God. Good. But the demons believe that too, uh, and they shake with fear. So believing God and believing his promises to us uh, is ultimately what God has sought from the people that he made and is therefore ultimately the only thing that matters. So the question for us is, have we believed God and believed the promises that he's made to us in Jesus? That's what Paul says makes us true children of Abraham, uh, right with God by placing our faith in him. And so at the end of Galatians 3, we looked at it last week, Paul says that the purpose of the Old Testament law um, was first of all to point out people's sin and their need for a Savior, their need for Jesus in the first place. Uh, and secondly, Paul says the purpose of the law was to preserve the nation of Israel, a sort of a, a protective custody or a, or a quarantine, just to hold this group of people together until the time was right for the Messiah uh, to come through them and to offer freedom to all people from their slavery to sin and to the law. And so Galatians 4 is all about this concept of being an heir of God's promises, of inheriting what God has promised to those who put their trust in him. For those who put their trust in, in, in Jesus, in the perfect once for all time completed sacrifice that he made on the cross for our sins. And the nightmare that Paul is experiencing this, in this chapter is that these Galatians are walking away from that pure simple faith from their spiritual inheritance for all practical purposes to live as slaves again. So let me read the, the first few verses for you here in Galatians chapter 4 today. I'm going to be reading from the, the New Living Translation. He writes, if a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. There's a couple things I want to highlight in this opening passage. First, Paul says that uh, before Christ came into our life, we were slaves. And the ultimate spiritual reality of human experience is that every person lives either in Christ or in slavery. Those are the only two places that we can be. Most of us have never thought of ourselves uh, in that way as ever having been uh, a slave because slavery is such uh, an ugly word. We'd never describe ourselves that way, but that's exactly what Paul says that we were. He says that our slavery was to the basic spiritual principles of this world, and, and that master that we were under slavery to can be summed up in two words, sin and religion. Those are the basic spiritual principles of the world. Sin is living apart from God and suffering the consequences of living that life that way outside of relationship with him. And then religion is making efforts to do better and somehow appease God, get him to love and accept us. And the Bible says that those efforts are futile, that they are, those attempts are just as broken as we are. And so our freedom from slavery to sin and to religion is not earned by anything that we do, 
but by what Jesus did. Verses 4 and 5 here say, When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves. And so it was the perfect life of Jesus, a human like us who was born to a woman just like we were, who lived under God's law uh, and never once ever broke it. It was his sacrifice that allowed him to be the perfect once for all time sacrifice to pay for all of our sins. Jesus purchased our freedom, the scriptures say, with his own blood, with his perfect life and death. And that is good for all who put their faith in him. But it gets even better. Not only are we freed from slavery, Paul says, but then we actually get adopted into God's very family. Verses 6 and 7 say, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. That word Abba here is a Uh, Aramaic word that Jesus used when he cried out to the Father the night that he was betrayed to be crucified. It's a a term of intimate endearment, and and most literally translated, what it means is daddy. That's the kind of relationship that we can have with God when we place our faith in Christ. Paul says when we accept what Jesus did for us on the cross, we can approach God in exactly the same way that Jesus does. Can you imagine that? Now, it would be good enough if the President of the United States uh, gave a pardon to a death row criminal and they were released from prison. That would be a pretty big deal. It would be something to celebrate and something they would celebrate for sure. But can you imagine that taking the next step, if the President then adopted that criminal as his own child and moved him into the White House to live with him and enjoy that prestige? That's exactly what God has done for us who have put our faith in Christ. We've not only been rescued from slavery, we've been adopted as his children. And we can call out Abba, Daddy, because we have that intimate relationship with him. So if you're a Christian here this morning, I want to ask you a question. Are you aware that Jesus purchased freedom for you when you believed? Because what happens a lot of times in our Christian life is somehow we think that there are things that we have to do Uh, to earn God's love, or to pay God back, or to make up some difference that is left between what Jesus did for us and what we need to be right with God. And that's just not the case. Jesus purchased our forgiveness. It was paid in full. Starting in verse 8 here in Galatians, he says, Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that did not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You're trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years, and I fear for you that perhaps all of my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things, for I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. This is what's keeping Paul up at night. Uh, and, And this phrase, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, this is the only time that Paul uses this in the entire New Testament. This is his deepest concern for any of the churches that he ministered to because the heart of the gospel is at stake. These, these believers in Christ that he loves, that he's invested so much of his life in, that he's suffered to bring the gospel to, are actually in the process of ignoring the immeasurable inheritance that they have in Christ and exchanging it for living under man-made rules and laws again. Can you imagine Paul's horror at that prospect? As we looked at last week, these false teachers came into the Galatian churches uh, and were telling them that in order to be saved, they not only had to have faith in Jesus, but they had to keep all of the Jewish traditions and laws as well. And so here's where Paul gets very tender with his friends and, and pours out his heart to them to call them back to the truth of the gospel. Starting in verse 13, he says, Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and you cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I am telling you the truth? 
Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right, but let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were there with you right now so I could change my tone, but at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. Paul is heart sick at this prospect of his friends abandoning God's grace and returning again to a state of slavery by trying to follow rules uh, to make or keep themselves right with God. And Paul felt this way uh, because of an important truth. It's one of the it's number three in your notes there. Friends don't let friends live in slavery. Paul is being the dearest kind of friends that these Christians could, could ever hope to have. He, he does a few things in these verses that demonstrate the authenticity and the, of his friendship towards them. First, he takes the initiative, uh, the initiative to restore uh, that relationship, even though these other teachers have come in and uh, worked to try and shut off the communication between these believers and Paul, he won't let that keep him from attempting reconciliation. He's working at it. Secondly, Paul's trying to remind the churches of exactly how God sees them. That's what we do for people that we want to free from any kind of slavery that they're in, to remind them of how God sees them, of how precious they are to him. Third, he speaks truth to them, even sharp truth. And fourthly, he cares for them as if they were members of his very own family. And we here in the orchard, if we want to be people who are sharing God's grace with our community, um, leading others to the, the same inheritance that we have found in Jesus, uh, we should do those same things. In the final section of this chapter, Paul returns again to the Old Testament Hebrew Abraham uh, that he uh, brought up last chapter in order to demonstrate that these Judaizers, these people that have come in and declared that the Galatians don't have the true faith, but they, they need to, f to follow the law, uh, Paul says they're not really following the example of Abraham themselves. Starting in verse 21, we read, Paul says, Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons, one from his slave wife, one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. So here we need a real quick refresher on the Old Testament story uh, of Abraham and his children. So I'll try and do it in, in 30 seconds or less. Uh, Abraham was 75 when he was called by God to go to a place that God would show him and where God would make him uh, a great nation, where God would provide he and his wife with many descendants. Fast forward 10 years, Abraham is now uh, there in the promised land. He is uh, 10 years older, he's 85, still no baby. And so Sarah starts getting uh, nervous and says, well, I've got a plan. Take my servant, my slave woman, Hagar, as another wife, have a baby with her, and that way at least we can make sure that we have one descendant uh, to, to carry on the family. Uh, even though that wasn't God's plan, Abraham said, okay, and he went along with it. And uh, so they have a son, uh, Abraham and Hagar, and that's when the problems begin. Uh, Hagar starts taunting Sarah because Hagar has a child and Sarah does not. And so uh, Sarah decides to make Hagar's life miserable in return and Hagar ends up running off with her son and now Abraham has lost the only son he had. Well, time passes, Hagar and, and the, the child Ishmael come back to the home and uh, life resumes uh, normal. Now, 13 years later, Sarah finally becomes pregnant uh, on the verge of death and it's obviously a miracle that God causes this to happen. Um, and so she gives birth to the promised son, Isaac. Uh, but now this first son that was conceived outside of God's plan by Abraham and Sarah's attempts to uh, be right with God on their own uh, plans uh, begins to harass young Isaac, the child of the promise. And ultimately, the slave woman and her son have to leave in order for peace to reign in Abraham's home. And so the bottom line of, of this episode in the life of Abraham is that trying to accomplish God's plan in our own flesh inevitably ends in failure. Trying to be right with God by our efforts ends 
in failure and destruction. The Christian author uh, Richard Foster writes, uh, consider the story of Hans the tailor. Because of his reputation, an influential entrepreneur visiting his city ordered a tailor-made suit. But when he came to pick up his suit, the customer found that one sleeve twisted that way and the other this way, and one shoulder bulged out and one caved in, and he pulled and managed to make his body fit. And as he returned home on the bus, another passenger noticed his odd appearance and asked if Hans the tailor had made the suit. Uh, receiving an affirmative reply, the man remarked, Amazing! I knew that Hans was a good tailor, but I had no idea he could make a suit fit so perfectly for someone as deformed as you. <laughs> That's what attempting to live by the law looks like. We push and shove ourselves and sometimes others into some of the most grotesque configurations in order to conform ourselves uh, to our own ideas about what makes us right with God. And these Judaizers who are trying to lead the Galatians into legalistic conformity to the law and their traditions were doing exactly that. Paul says that their motives weren't good. Verse 17, he says, those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They're trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. I find that that's generally what is happening when men put law-based religion and rules on people. It's to lead people to themselves instead of to Jesus. Paul wraps up this chapter with a clear delineation again of who are the true children of Abraham, the true children of God's promise. In verse 30, he says, what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. New York's famed LaGuardia Airport is named after Fiorello LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York City during the Great Depression and World War II. He was called by adoring New Yorkers the Little Flower because he was only five foot four and he always wore a carnation in his lapel. Uh, he was a colorful character who strived to be among uh, his people. So it wasn't unusual for him to ride with the firefighters on their engines, uh, raid speakeasies with the police, take field trips with orphans. And on a bitterly cold night in January of 1935, the mayor turned up at a night court that served the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismi dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench himself. And within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told the mayor that her daughter's husband had left, her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. However, the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor, the man told the mayor. She's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He extracted a bill and tossed it into his famous hat, saying, Here is the $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that their grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, New York City papers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered woman who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Fifty cents of that amount was contributed by the grocery store owner himself, while some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and New York City policemen, each of whom had just paid 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, gave the mayor a standing ovation. You know, LaGuardia could have lived by the letter of the law there and made that woman pay what she owed, but instead he went beyond the letter and he paid her debt for her. Of course, that's exactly what Jesus did for each one of us. He could have made us pay for our sins. We were rightly and justly deserving of his punishment, but instead he paid it for us. And not only that, he offered to adopt us into his family where everything that he has is ours. And living by faith in Jesus far exceeds living by the law. Living in God's grace far exceeds law-based living by leaps and bounds. God offers us a new covenant relationship with him, a new way to be right with God that's based on faith in what Jesus did 
for us. And once you have that, that is an inheritance you do not want to give back by following law or for any other reason. I'm going to invite the band to come back up and uh, prepare to lead us in a song as we uh, prepare for communion. Pastor and author Tim Keller writes this in his commentary on Galatians. He says, the way to progress as a Christian is to continue, is continually to repent and uproot these systems in the same way that we became Christians by the vivid depiction and redepiction of Christ's saving work for us and the abandoning of self-trusting efforts to complete ourselves. We must go back again and again to the gospel of Christ crucified so that our hearts are more deeply gripped by the reality of what he did and who we are in him. That's why we do communion every week. We want to be reminded again and again of what he did for us, so that we are not tempted to try and do anything on our own to be accepted by Him. Let's pray. God, we thank You for the truth of Your Word, for its encouragement to us, sometimes sharply when it contrasts with what we assume to be right. God, we hear so many voices that tell us that we need to do this or that or the other thing in order to be accepted by you and forgiven by you. God, your word makes it clear that the work that you invite us to do is to believe in the one that you have sent on our behalf. God, for those who have never placed their faith in Jesus here this morning, God, I would help you, I would ask that you would help them to understand the depth of your love for them. You sent your one and only son to die for their sins so that they wouldn't have to jump through hoops, they wouldn't have to make themselves better, but that by believing in what you've done for them, they can have life. God, for those of us who have made that confession of faith uh, at some point in our lives, but others have come into our life later on and told us that we weren't doing enough, that we weren't good enough, that we had to do this or that, or give this or that up in order to be right with you. God, remind us of the pure, simple truth of that we're right with you because of what Jesus did, because we've trusted in him. God, impress those truths on our heart this morning as we remember again the reason that we can be forgiven and have reason for living and have the hope of heaven. In Jesus' name.